recording started, so fucking away we go. Right. <laughs> oh, shit. Do you want me to do the tune? Yeah? We'll yeah. Do the tune. All yeah. Right. All right. Great start. All right, let's have a go. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the No Ifs, Puts or Bogies podcast. We are a no-nonsense, straight-talking golf podcast discussing all the hot topics in the world of golf. This podcast is brought to you in association with Barreto Golf, a stylish, affordable golf clothing brand. Visit BarettoGolf.com for the latest offers. That's B-A-R-R-E-T-O Golf.com. This podcast is also brought to you on behalf of the Golf Gang Network. Please do go check out some of the other golfing podcasts. And without any further ado, I will pass you over to your host, Mr. Harry Clark. Woo! Well done, DB. Well done. Well done. Yeah, first time I've done that, actually. Um, Mate, yeah. yeah. You've done well. I was a bit of village with the music, but we'll, get, we'll hone it in in due course. All we need That's is... It, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. All we need is a few yeah, cut, cut, cut the music there, mate. Nice. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, that's, you've definitely been practicing that in the mirror, haven't you, Dan? That, that's been every night for the past week. Yeah. I um, Just not in the mirror, mate, in the shower. First thing I do when I wake up, the last thing I do before I go to bed, I need to make sure that it's spot on for the massive audience that is going to listen to this podcast. Right. So, brand new podcast. Let's let's all introduce ourselves. Who we are, DB? Do you want to kick things off, mate? Yes, I am DB, one half of Barreto Golf, um, probably the better half to most of you lot. Um, bang average golfer, but still better than AB. Um, World handicap index seventeen point five at the moment. Home golf course, the home of golf, North Middlesex Golf Club, um, and yeah, here to give my honest opinions on the world of golf. <laughs> Nice. AB, you're up. Yes, mate. So, yeah, AB, Alex Barreto, the other half of Barreto <laughs> Golf. Um, 19.4 I am at the moment on the England Golf Handicap. Um, home course, Brampton Heath Golf Club as of this month. So we'll touch on that, I'm sure, at some point during the podcast series. But, um, yeah, I've recently moved club. Um, so looking forward to getting you boys up here for a round but um yeah usually the quieter brother i'm just kind of in the background and let my brother talk as he w- wishes um as you'll see on this podcast but, I, you know, I, chime, say, people I, chime in, I chime in once in a while with the odd nugget so um yeah buzzing to get started i know we've been sitting on this a little while um so lovely to have you aboard as well clarky so i'll hand over to you to introduce yourself. So I'm Harry. I'm drafted in by these boys to, you know, keep control of the chaos that's going to happen on everything to do with this podcast and also their social channels. Um, My handicap is happy to not lose more than five balls whilst going around uh, around a course. Um, So, yeah, that's that's a little bit about me. Um, Lads, you you are are Guy Charnock, mate. And you know, if you're if you're a golfing podcast listener, people will understand that. So you are the guy Charnock of our podcast, and that that's a very high compliment for you. He's actually not a terrible so, golfer, to be fair. I think he was. Yeah. So, he was a club, club fitter for Nike or something like that. So he does all right. You can. Look no, I'm sitting on a podcast well. with you boys. Sitting on a podcast <laughs> with you boys. I'm not working with Nike, but hey. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get there, mate. One day. Maybe, maybe, who knows? All right, let's kick things off. Players, what a finish to the end of that, by the way. Yeah, I've got to say, so set the scene a little bit for those of you who might not have seen it, not to jump to the end straight away because it was a hell of a finish. But the number one thing that I really enjoyed about this week is it was in Florida and the timings work out so well for a British viewer. Like you could just... I think it came on Sky, like the early groups come on like in the early afternoon and it rolls through to about 10 p.m. at night, which for those of us who work from home these days, um, is great afternoon viewing, especially over the sort of Friday when no one really does any work anyway. And then Saturday, Sunday, Sunday night, watching them come in and they finish about 10 o'clock. It's just superb for the English fans. Like I really enjoy just watching it over there um, and it's great to watch it. Of course, 
is beautiful, famous, very famous 17th hole, which I'm sure all three of us would land it straight on the green without any doubt. But um, plenty, plenty of water around on the course and plenty of uh, lost golf balls. Roy went in the water like three or four times over the course of a couple of days. Um, so it's just a, a, always a really eventful tournament, but it came to a head on the actual last hole that was played. I'm pretty sure they were the last group out, weren't they? Um, so Scotty was in the clubhouse on 20 under and Wyndham Clark was on 19. And I think it was a 17 foot putt that he needed to sink. And how this ball has not gone in the hole, I will never know. It literally went in, rolled all the way around and came back out. Like he was almost half yeah. celebrating. I don't know what your thoughts on it were, Al. Well, mate, if you see the still on Instagram of the image, the ball's like half in the cup. So <laughs> it's a matter of he's hit it marginally too hard. And that's all you can say because it defied gravity, really. Like, I mean, it not dropping has cost him a shed load of money. It missed, you know, the playoff. So Scotty, as you said, was on the range warming up and... I mean, I was off the sofa, you know, the, the fruit and nut bar was down. I had to, you know, leap up, <laughs> leap up off my chair. And uh, I couldn't believe that he didn't, it didn't drop. But there we are. Yeah, so just on the would... prize money, I, I saw Scotty won like four point something million dollars. Second place was like 1.8. There's obviously 1.8 million dollars is fucking loads of money. Don't get me wrong, but it's under half of what he could have won. <laughs> When you think about it like that, it's like, you know, just watching it slip through, slip through your hands, really. How would uh, how would you boys react to that happening on the course? The ball doing exactly what it's done and just kind of sitting there. I think me personally, I'm quite an animated character. I would have um, I would have been on the floor probably because I, <laughs> the ball, it was one of those putts where from the minute he hit it, I thought, oh, my God, he sunk it and this is going to play off. And it literally, like, it dropped in the hole. I cannot explain it any differently. It was in the hole, and it came back out. I was just like, yeah. I would have been away with a gaff. I mean, I would I would say, and, I mean, Clarky, you've played with us a few times and done a bit of filming for us as well. DB and I, we are your typical average mid-range handicapper golfer that loves to give commentary on every single shot and every single outcome that we experience on a golf course. So, yeah, I imagine we both would have just gone absolutely mental. Um, I think DB would have, like, chewed my ear off for the rest of the evening in the clubhouse because of how it didn't drop. Um, oh, yeah, if I was Scotty Scheffler, no one would have heard the end of it for a long, long time because you'd just be buzzing. I, think, I mean, yeah. DB chews the ear off of people... No matter what, you know, part four or no part going in. Do you know what I mean? So that that's that's by the by. Um <laughs> in terms of uh Scotty, you know, making that part at the end, what do you think about his his putter, his new putter that he's got? Yeah, so got an A B. What's he working with? Well, um, so he's he's switched up to a tailor made uh I think it's the spider tour putter, um, which is a mallet. So he previously used a blade, tailor-made, obviously. Um, I don't specifically know the, the brand blade or the, or the model, rather. But, um, yeah, so a fortnight ago. So he's been having struggles, I guess, over the last 18 months. So even though he's winning and his stats, sort of tee to green, are, like, up there as, as the top of the PGA Tour, um, he changed putter two weeks ago and he's won the last two events um so yeah his putting struggles seem to be behind him i think he was absolutely flawless pretty much yesterday um you know eagles and birdies made a big comeback to to clinch the victory so um it obviously looks like it's a it's a good change for him leading into um a critical period of the season masters on the horizon past champion so, yeah, I, I mean, it, it looks like he's doing the job. Um, I think Rory McIlroy's had a bit of a hand 
in this change. So he went into the box a few weeks back. Um, so the PGA Tour coverage nowadays, they're, they're having a lot of players. Once they finish their round, if they're out earlier, they're going into the commentary box. Um, and, you know, they're, they're doing live commentary of the guys that are still playing. And Rory shared a view of Scotty and his, and his putter. And um, he, he kind of recommended that he make a change. And then the very next two events since that change, um, Scotty has delivered a win both times. And interestingly enough, poor old Wyndham Clark, he's come second both weekends as well. So yeah. it's Just been the top two. To Wyndham, I've got some thoughts on Scott here because he's the world number one and he's the best player in the world, I would say, comfortably by a country mile at the moment. He is a ridiculous golfer. And for someone with like, a, he's got the most bizarre technique. It's like, if I turned up for a golf lesson and tried to hit a golf ball like that, it get coached out of you straight away. Like the pro wouldn't have it. And he somehow seems to stripe it all over the gaff and, and get it in the hole in way less shots than everyone else. But I ain't sure I'm having this putter stuff. Obviously he's improved a little bit on the, on the putts over the last couple of weeks. But I think yet like yesterday, I'm sure they said on commentary, we'll have to look it up if they, either of you want to do it. I, I think he was ranked 37th for the weekend with the putter, right? And the bloke won major tournaments and won all sorts before he changed his putter anyway. But also, if I went out tomorrow, I'd putt with a blade. And if I bought a mallet putter, it's not all of a sudden going to make me a gun. This is all psychological. Yeah, that's because it's you're 17 game. handicap, mate. He's, he's found... He's the number one player in the world. In his putting game. No, it's psychological. Really? He's found something in his putting game where he just feels more comfortable. I don't think it's necessarily the tool in question. It's the, more the fact that it's a placebo effect. He now thinks the ball is going to go in the hole. So the ball goes in the hole more, right? Now, obviously, you can put that down to him having a new putter. But what I'm saying is the actual fact that he's changed putter, I think, makes little to zero to fucking no difference at all. It's all psychological, all placebo. Golf is played up here, like 90% of it, so they say anyway. Not that anyone should be taking any advice from me, but I just think, what a load of bollocks. It's a bit like, do you know what they say? Like, you watch all these YouTube videos, the Instagram reels and all that. Oh, you know, you keep slicing it with your driver. Oh, go get a new stealth. Like, I don't fucking make you hit it straight. You've still got to be able to do it. Like, just because he's got a new putter doesn't mean that he's going to just start sinking all these putts all the time. There's something else that's changed. And I'm sure he'll talk about it at some point, but I'm not having the fact that he's just got a new putter and all of a sudden the ball's just going in more. It's one or two, it's placebo effect and it's psychological. He's more comfortable than himself, without doubt. We should uh, we should get Rory to say that if people wear Beretta golf clothing, then they're more likely to to sink their putts or hit the fairway or something like that. I mean, that's great. Yeah. Of, uh, there, really. Yeah. That would be yeah. fantastic. But if anyone's seen our Instagram, they might know that it would be slightly false advertising because yeah. it ain't true. <laughs> uh, April Fool's Day is coming again. Um, April Fool's so, coming again. So we can get him on. That is so true. <laughs> That's so true. Maybe we maybe we tap into that then. Yeah, good shout. Yeah. Um, did you see Scotty hole out on, was it uh, the fort, his eagle, where he's just like out of nowhere? Just on, yeah. I don't. In fact, I don't need to. Park. I'll just chuck it in from here. Yeah. yeah. Well, so yesterday he hit eight under, which was so six birdies and, and that eagle that you mentioned there. So no, no bogeys or anything yesterday. He was absolutely flawless. And um, yeah, like DB said, he. <clears throat> I mean, DB, what clubs do you use? I've got. Actually, probably just about the most expensive. Yeah. I remember not so not so long ago. Not so long ago, you forked out the best part of three grand on a whole new set of tailor mates, didn't you? It's about two and, uh, pounds. Yeah. And whereas I, I'm still on a beginner set of Yonex that cost me a hundred quid off Facebook, and uh, you know, I, I think we're we're pretty much level. I know you are slightly ahead of me now, but I was. Seven, close to 17 not too long ago it's only because i've switched clubs in the last few weeks and the, my course is much harder now but um 
I guess I don't really I get what you're trying to say about the the you know the placebo effect, the psychological factor, but I think at the top end of the game, he obviously had a fundamental issue and the new putter style and the technology that's gone into that putter and the mechanics of it has obviously made it click for him because although he may have won the odd event here and there and still been towards the top of the rankings, the last fortnight he's been absolutely unreal. Well, time will and tell because I think because over the course of the season, he will be the same ability of putter as what he was always because he's on a bit of a pebble patch at the minute. Fine. That happens in golf all the time. You go for it. He's won two tournaments on the bounce. Well, I say it happens in golf all the time. If you're really good, it does. But, you know, I think over the course of the season, you won't suddenly see him. When you look back at the end of the year and you look at the top putters, you're not going to see Scotty Scheffler near the top, I don't think. Whereas the last couple of weeks, he has been. It's not going to... It's not sustainable, I don't think. And it ain't going to... Just because he's changed his putter, I don't think that will happen. But full credit to him, he's won $8 million in the last couple of weeks. So maybe he yeah. knows more than what DB does. Imagine that. Imagine someone knowing more than you. <laughs> it could be. Actually, I just found a little image that PJ Tour posted yesterday. And his last 15 holes to win the championship, he had eight birdies, one eagle and six pars. Which isn't bad, really, at all. <laughs> Yeah. it's like he's, he's absolutely he, next level at the moment he's clutch he turns up when it matters like he could be like like eight eight shots eight under yesterday shouldn't really there's not many people that come from like eight shots behind that are just gonna rock up on a sunday and be like oh, yeah, fuck it up I, I might just win today now, he is one of those guys it's like he can do that yeah yeah i've got um at risk of opening a massive can of worms here but we obviously, but we all watched it live last night. It, I think UK time. It was on at about half past ten on your Sunday evening. And um, if you'd watched it all evening, like like we had, there's not one point in the evening where, with all the excitement and all the birdies going in and Chauvelet making an error and Scotty getting to the top, at no point was I watching thinking that I, I really wish Taylor Gooch was here. <laughs> like, honestly, like just or like wacky Neiman or like like you know all these live guys that are saying oh there's an asterisk against an event because I'm not here and all this stuff and it's just utter bollocks. I mean the PGA Tour as a product is still miles better and the last few weeks like you know the end result has churned out like some unbelievable golf and it's gripping. It's you know the competitiveness your Sunday night finish, you've worked for the previous three days to put yourself into a position. And um, yeah, it was just, it was good to see that it's still going. And then, you know, you look at the top, I think, I don't think Schofle's won a major, but I think the other four guys in the top five, so you've got Scheffler, Clark, Brian Harmon was up there and Fitzpatrick was up there. You know, they're all major champions. So yeah, I think um, yeah, and six still, as well. still very much the the, the prime tour um, in the world of golf for me, as our listeners will discover over the many episodes that we hope to churn out on this podcast. No, I think without doubt, they talk a lot about, oh, the fans are missing out and, oh, this is about the fans and we want to grow the game. But they, uh, if anything, obviously they've lined their pockets absolutely fine, uh, each to their own, you know. We're all, mm. we're all here for the same objective, really. Um, and that's to live comfortable lives and do whatever. We won't get too much into that. But the the actual crux of it is, is I think they're the ones that are missing out because the players and the PGA Tour in general has iconic events that people want to win. Like mm. that, this year was the 50th players and never once has it been retained apart from now, which is Scott, he's obviously made history. And it's like, that's iconic. It's like no one... Quite frankly, it gives a fuck if they win in like Adelaide or wherever they play. Like, what? Well, who cares? Like, who, who actually cares if you've won on some random golf course in Adelaide? Where I think I don't know if this is true or not, but I saw on social media after Adelaide won a, a while back, they had to shut the course for like six months because they chucked a load of beer all over it or whatever. 
Yeah. Like, hole in one, they tried to make it like the waste management. Yeah. And then the, the ground I, staff had to fucking close the golf course. Like, nice one. Yeah. Fans are really winning there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't. we don't want to go off too much on a tangent too early on into the no. whole PGA live debate, but just seeing as it has been such a clutch finish both weekends and there's, you know, the big names have been up there and um, it's still been super exciting, great product. I thought I'd just mention it. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, cool. Let's let's kind of move on. I know you guys are, are big on your, on your mindset sort of stuff and um, we touched on it a couple of times just already as well. Um, DB, I know you mentioned about like Wyndham Clark and his his kind of mindset and the things that he's doing at the moment. Did you want to kind of talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. So, spoiler alert for full swing. So, if you haven't seen it, maybe like skip forward thirty seconds. But I'll try and keep it like top lines. I didn't give too much away. Episode three, I think it's called Mind Games, where it looks at Joel Darman and Wyndham Clark. Basically, in the in twenty twenty three, Joel Darman had a really bad year. And he kind of was sort of saying along the lines of he doesn't really buy into like the psychological aspect of the game. And, you know, he was kind of getting in, into a bit of drinking habits and like not really enjoying golf. And like in what I would call it when we do the mindset coaching stuff, a downward spiral. So everything is trending down for him. And Wyndham Clark started seeing a sports psychologist. I want to say he said it was about 18 months ago. And in 18 months, he's won like four PGA Tour events and a major, something along those lines, right? So it includes the US Open. Uh, yeah. And, and got played, himself into the top 10. And he's got himself in the top 10 in the world, played in the Ryder Cup and all sorts of stuff. So he's he's on what I would call like an upward spiral. And he talked about some of the importance of mindfulness and coaching and psychology. And actually, I used to think he was a bit of a prick, to be honest with you. Uh, he said a lot of things in the build-up to the Ryder Cup, but I was want to go toe to with Rory and all this sort of stuff. But after watching Full Swing, I've got a bit of a newfound respect for him. And I sort of took a bit of uh, extra time trying to watch him over the weekend. And a couple of things that I noticed is every time he hit a bogey, he bounced back within two holes, got the shot back within two holes. So if you look at his scorecard across all four rounds, I'm pretty sure every time he dropped the shot, he had the shot back pretty much instantly within two, if not three holes. Then the other thing was like on the third round on Saturday, on the 17th, I don't know why, and I don't know if he did it on the first and second round because I didn't watch it. 17th is the par three. He randomly decided he wasn't going to tee up the ball and he just hit it off the ground and chunked it and it went in the water and he dropped the shot straight away. And again, on the 18th, which is an iffy hole, he's, he's got a par back, so he didn't really have a chance to regain it. But on the second round, on the second hole of round four, birdie again, got the shot back straight away. On the back nine, he's at two bogeys. The next hole, hole 11, straight back in with a birdie. And then he's at a bogey on hole 14. And he's here two birdies, 16, 17 to get him back. And obviously he nearly birdied 18 to, to tie the lead as well. Mm -hmm. I think it just goes to show that actually the psychological aspect of the game is sometimes where it's that one and lost, really. I know he comes second, but in the grand scheme of things, in golf, he's winning, right? This guy has gone from an absolute pretty much like nobody. Grant, he was on tour. I think he got on tour in like 2017, 2018. And to be honest, until like last year, I'd never heard of him. I didn't really know who he was. And he's in somewhat ways burst onto the scene, if you will, even though it's a few years after he's qualified. And a bloke's got four or five wins in 12 months. I just think it speaks volumes. Actually, on a side note, I believe Joel Darman is now seeing a sports psychologist and he popped up in 11th on the weekend. So that just goes to show... <laughs> It does really work because the bloke dropped down to like 200th in the world during um, full swing. Well, the full swing season one, yeah, they were showing him ranked as 70th. And on the episode that I watched over the weekend, they were showing him ranked as about 100th. But at the end of 2023, I'm pretty sure he was outside the world top 200. And the bloke's rocked up to the players this weekend after seeing his sports psychologist and got a little tied 11th for, for his joy. So I think it just goes to show that it... It's the most important thing, your mental health, your mindfulness, the psychology of 
all aspects of life, not just golf, is how people become really successful. And I think it's the the bounce back ability is where it's really important and really crucial. Me and AB what, do. Uh, Go on. What, what are your thoughts on that, AB? Do you agree? Do you, do you think that it is that kind of like internal thing that's got him back to you know when he goes shot down or whatever he can he can pull it back within a couple? Do you think that that's down to his psychology there? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, the key thing with with psychology is obviously at the elite end of the game, it, you know they're going to be doing things uh, in terms of the psychology part at an elite level as well. But I guess I think DB was about to mention it, but him and I, we've been doing our own sort of mindfulness over the last, uh, I think DB, you've been doing it about 18 months, yeah. myself about six months. Um, so we've got a life coach each. And um, what well, she's been, sorry? It's the same one. We see the same, yeah, same one. Yeah, yeah. so we're, we're seeing the same life coach. And um, <clears throat> essentially, for, for me anyway, in my experience, we've focused a lot on golf, actually. So um, understanding how the brain works and trying to find that flow state. So obviously the guys at the elite end of the game, Scheffler yesterday, would have been in such a flow state that you and I and us three were never, ever going to reach. But there is the ability to figure out how to get to our level, if you like. So as a 19 handicapper, <clears throat> how do I make sure I stay at 19 or get lower um, as opposed to always just being, you know, 20 plus um, and always just hacking it around, scoring 100 plus each week? Um, so, yeah, we've done a lot of work on it. So I definitely think, you know, the guys that DB's mentioned, you know, Wyndham Clark, Damon, there's, there's loads of them. Tiger Woods, I mean, he's the, probably the greatest example of, you know, being right up here and then he can transfer it into his ability as well. But, um, yeah, it, it's it's been really interesting. And it's something that growing up or whatever, unless you actually get educated in it properly by a, by a trained professional, you can do reading into it. You can listen to podcasts. You can do whatever you sort of want to try and learn it yourself. But the, and I've done that as well over in the past. You know, I've read various books. You know, things like um, the Chimp Paradox, for example, as a psychological book. Um, a few other ones such as that. And then um, it doesn't really. It never really changed anything. So actually, working with a professional and understanding things and being told things and putting it into practice has um, had a real great impact on me, my lifestyle, but also in terms of, you know, golf. Um, and yeah, it, I mean, it even before I uh, switched clubs, I my last round at my previous golf club, I shot a 77, uh, which is obviously unreal. And in that it's day, I can, to do that. Yeah, Great so I can, I mean, I can, I, I, I visualize, I can still see me myself playing every single shot that day, which is weird because there's other rounds of golf you play and you forget what you even shot on a hole. But I can, I, I can, I can easily uh, replay every single shot I played that morning. Um, the night before, um, I, I prepared for golf. So I had been visualizing all week about playing golf on a Saturday morning. Um, and then before bed, uh, I've been doing breath work. So I won't get too technical, but it's basically like, that's what helps open different states of mind is through your breathing. So uh, I did a load of prep the night before. And then when I woke up, I was like really energized. I was, I was fresh. Um, I got to the course, I prepared, I was as relaxed as I've ever been on a golf course. And, you know, when you get on a, even when you're a high handicapper, you can get on a run of, you know, two or three pars or two couple of pars in a bogey in a, in a row. And then, you know, you might have a seven and eight or whatever, and your round falls off. But on that morning, I, the first seven holes I parred, and you think the run's going to end, the run's going to end. And it just didn't. And I was just in that complete flow state of mind that uh, everything I hit went exactly where I wanted it to. I was sinking parts, which I never normally do. 
if I made an error, such as so on the sixth hole, for example, I hit a 240-yard drive to the middle of the fairway, and then I overhit my pitching wedge, and it went over the green, and I chipped back on to within a few inches for a tap in. And if I wasn't in the, sometimes when you're not in the right state of mind, you you duff the chip, and then you go from having a nailed-on birdie or par opportunity to okay now you're putting for a five or worse sort of thing and even that you know my whole round i had i had a a mare on one hole where it was a par three and i i pulled it into a bunker and i couldn't get out so i ended up tripling that hole that was my only like bad hole of the day and the very next hole i birdied so again like Wyndham clark over here yeah Disney's reference Wyndham clark and how he bounced back so there you go i mean Watch out, PJ Tour, I'm coming. I'm coming. So, I'm coming. So prepare the night before, get your breathing in, and then shoot 77 is what you're saying, yeah? Mate, it's as easy as that. Easy as that, pal. <laughs> easy. easy as no, that. No, no, there's it. Yeah, maybe if there's interest, you know, you can get in touch if you if you think it's interesting. Subject Drop us a DM can... on Instagram if anyone wants any more information on any mindfulness stuff. Um yeah. We can maybe even get her on and talk about golf because I, I actually talk about golf a, a lot. It's actually a it's lot of synergy about golf and real life and like how to be successful at golf and how to be successful in real life are actually like not million miles away in general, real terms. She loves talking about it. So if anyone is really that interested, maybe we get her on the pod and... Um, we can pick our brains apart a little bit. She'll be bombarded with like angry golfers trying to change the <laughs> whole golf new back. market for her. I'll be, I'll be charging you like GB and shoot at 77. Mate, only 5% of golfers break 80. So I will reference the 77 that I hit. I just on that, I just think that's the, the biggest. I see that Instagram reel all the time. And I just think that's the biggest load of bollocks I've ever heard in my life. They go like, oh, oh look. Only like 20% of the golfers break 100. Well, my whole fucking golf club does that every weekend. And I do that every weekend. And I never win shit. I never win anything. So where are all these players that are supposedly crap? But so oh, they're, they're right. They're them. actually right here, mate. Just let you know they yeah. are right here. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever broken 80? That's the real key one here. No, I haven't. Yeah. And my best is 82, I think. Have you ever won a club comp? I haven't, no. Uh, no I've, won a team, to AB, mate. I've won a team golf club event. No, we won no. a Texas scramble. Come, come, back, come back when you won an individual one, mate. You won an individual one? Yeah, Trilby Hat, Della Pre Golf Club. I didn't actually know that. Yeah, I won 89. I shot an 89, Stableford. So I, I, don't, I, don't know how many points that, I don't know what how many points that was, but... Um, it was off the blacks, mate. So I was probably yeah. 22. That's my shot. 130 quid. Could say, okay, you're still going, maybe. Nice. Um, <laughs> I, th I think that, like, you could say that DB's kind of living in your shadow a little bit there, then, mate, considering you've you've won, um, <laughs> you've won something, whereas DB hasn't. Coming back to full swing, um, the Fitzpatrick brothers, right? Yeah. DB, I know. That I know that you've got a lot to say on on these brothers because obviously you guys are brothers. Well, and first like and foremost, yeah, I really like them both, and I think they're two really top lads. And I really enjoyed the episode, but actually, you've you've lent in quite nice there because the whole episode is actually about Alex Fitzpatrick living in Matt Fitzpatrick's shadow, and like everywhere he goes, he gets asked how Matt's doing, and you know, oh, what's it like being Matt Fitzpatrick's brother? And I just thought I'd throw the question to AB like must have quite a lot of synergy with him because uh, he is known for being DB's brother. So everywhere he goes, he gets asked about me and I just wanted to throw it over to him and just see what it's like being in my shadow, pal. That's simply not true. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, in, in your world it is because you live in your own little bubble. But um, <laughs> for, for, for people that don't know us and, and new listeners, um, I'm actually older than Dan. So... By you might simple have logic, he's I'm always been in my that. shadow. <laughs> he's always been in my shadow. Um, but actually, in fairness, jokes aside, we actually we pretty much come as a pair, I would say. So usually we are 
quite equal. We come as a pair. If Dan gets invited somewhere, I'll get invited, vice versa. Um, but yeah, nice try. I mean, if he thinks I live in his bubble or his shadow, rather, then so be it. But um, I think, Clarky, you and I both know that that's not true. I think we can tell by the tone of AB's voice. It was painful for him to try and like deny it. <coughs> yeah, if you say so. <laughs> I was I was about to say that's a really nice way to end the podcast and then <laughs> come in with that again. Yeah, so now we're gonna have to go for another half an hour of uh trials and tribulations of A B versus D B on the golf course that usually doesn't go very well for me. Yeah. We, we do so, have a little bit on a golf In, in that regard, I am slightly in his shadow by the fact that he'll usually beat me by a couple of shots. And his current... We get, a, we get that one clipped up, Clarky. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, let, let, let's try and culminate this a little bit here, lads. We don't want to bore anyone for any more time. Um, let, let's, let's have first thoughts. First episode, how do we feel it's gone? Um, and then, obviously, we're going to try and get the next one out as soon as possible as well. Um, so people who have enjoyed watching can can kind of re re-listen to it as well. Um, yeah, let's, let's get forward. What do you think, boys? I've really enjoyed it, lads. It's been an absolute pleasure to be on uh, and discussing all the exciting things that have been going on over the weekend. Um, a quick favour to all the listeners. If you could leave us review and give us five stars, because you can possibly <laughs> give us any less. So, <laughs> give us five stars. That really does help along the way. And, uh, you know, the old Stephen Bartlett, 80% of you don't subscribe to this podcast, but do listen along. So please subscribe and we will get bigger and better guests. Get all of that nonsense in there. And, um, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. and look forward to the next one. Tell us what you want to hear. Comment on wherever this yeah. gets posted. YouTube, Instagram, I'm not sure. Clarky will tell you where it's going. Yeah, yeah. Going I mean, we've got plenty... Sorry, mate. Yeah, we've got plenty to get off our chests, but um, I think as a first episode goes, you know, we've done all right. We're, we can only get better from here. We'll be a little bit more refined as we go. Um, we'll get a few guests on. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll switch up the topics. Um, so, yeah, it's good to have you on board. Hopefully it will be good to have a number of listeners on board as well. And like DB says, get in touch. Let us know what you want us to chat about. And, um, yeah, we can only go upwards from here. Any final um, yeah, thoughts? It's all listeners. Yeah, it's all listeners. Thanks for thanks for listening. If you've got to this stage, well done. Um, <laughs> this is, this is <laughs> that's so that's true. Well um, and we'll, we'll catch you in the next one. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Good night.